This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, but we're doing it in a unique <laughs> way. This is a show about science. Oh. oh my God. By scientists. Tonight, Techno investigates climate change. I can really feel it migrating now. It's science versus politics. You know what this is? It's a snowball. From a city in the grips of a climate crisis. Neighbors were coming down, everybody was helping each other, pushing the car. To the epicenter of a political debate. Carbon pollution is CO2, and that's really not a pollutant. It's a plant food. We go to the front lines of a debate that may not be decided. They're going to raise the sidewalks. That must be, what, two feet? Until it's too late. As mayor, I don't have the liberty or the time to debate why climate change is happening. Dr. Shinny Samara is a mechanical engineer. With all of that innovation, mm -hmm. do you think it's actually going to solve the problem? Lindsay Moran is an ex-CIA operative and analyst. Why is this issue political? Dr. Crystal Dilworth is a molecular neuroscientist. Why does a small segment of scientists not believe? I'm Phil Torres. I'm an entomologist. Wow, that was something else. I mean, it was a real rush for me. That's our team. Now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Lindsay Moran, Dr. Crystal Dilworth, and Dr. Shinny Somara. Now, it's a debate that somehow is still raging on. Is the climate changing? Is man to blame? And is there anything we can do to stop this potential disaster? Most scientists agree the answer to those questions is yes, but that's only most scientists, not all of them. Shinny, Crystal, Lindsay, you each had a piece of the story. At the CIA, I was trained to analyze complex, competitive, and sometimes even contradictory data. And climate change really does fit into that model as well. But in Washington, D.C., where politics are always part of the equation, no matter what the science is, there's going to be contentious debate. I had a completely different experience because I was dealing with the scientists and citizens who are not actually debating if climate change is happening, but they were actually living it right now. I think it's really interesting because both sides of this debate claim to be on the side of science and they use scientific studies kind of as their ammunition. So we wanted to know who's right and things got pretty interesting. Yeah, you know, as scientists were trained to look at the data and go from there. And that's what we try to keep in mind as we dove into this debate, the politics of climate change. The picturesque sunrise on this strip of Miami Beach, Florida hides the true danger facing this tourist island. Florida is sort of an epicenter for climate change impacts. Those impacts are forcing a massive citywide reconstruction effort, turning Miami Beach into a real life laboratory to deal with a climate that's changing all too fast. And Florida's not alone, as Techno has discovered, traveling around the world to talk to experts on the forefront of climate science. We flew with NASA as they measured the Arctic ice melt on Greenland's glaciers, marking yet another year of decline. The whole um, climate of the Arctic has been changing. And we traveled to Peru, where rainforests are declining. In 2005, there was the biggest drought in the Amazon and the history of our records. In 2010, just five years later, an even bigger drought hit the Amazon. These are basically the climate projections playing out before our, our very eyes. And we saw a core sample from the last ice age to get a comparison on how quickly greenhouse gases are accumulating today. So this sample represents 3,000 years of changes mm -hmm. in carbon dioxide. Right, the equivalent change of greenhouse gases that happened just ice in the last decade took thousands of years to happen when the Earth was not being influenced by humans. These scientists reflect the fact that 97% of all research published on climate change say it is being fueled by man-made greenhouse gas emissions. You know, as scientists, we barely can agree on anything. So to say that 97% of experts, climate science experts, are saying that the climate system is warming today, to me, that's, that's phenomenal. Scientists aside, some politicians aren't buying it. It's not settled science. It changes. It gets hot, it gets cold. But 
man-made. Isn't that the question? <laughs> then why did the dinosaurs go extinct? Dinosaurs aside, Techno went to Washington, D.C., where a herd of lawmakers clearly don't agree with all the scientists we've interviewed, like Republican Senator Jeff Sessions questioning EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy. Would you acknowledge that the, uh, and over the last 18 years that the increase in temperature has been very little and that it is well below most of the environmental models that showed how fast temperature would increase? No, I would not agree with that, sir. A, a one degree temperature is significant. Of course, carbon pollution is CO2, and that's really not a pollutant. It's a plant food, and it doesn't harm anybody, except that it might include uh, temperature increases. And Senator Sessions isn't alone among Republican lawmakers. Because we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record. You know what this is? It's a snowball. And that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out. I'm not a scientist. I'm not qualified to debate the science over climate change. You know, I'm not a scientist, and I don't claim to be. I'm not a scientist either. But you know what? I know a lot of really good scientists at NASA and at NOAA and at our major universities. Topping President Obama's list of experts is Dr. John Holdren, director of the Office of Science and Technology. Techno's Lindsay Moran met with him just steps from the Oval Office. What we're facing is human-driven changes in global climate that are producing more hot days, more heat waves, more extreme downpours, more wildfires and droughts. Sea level is rising. The ocean is acidifying because it's absorbing some of the excess carbon dioxide that humans have added to the atmosphere into the ocean. But on Capitol Hill, Republican James Inhofe, chairman of the powerful Senate Environmental and Public Works Committee, disputes the idea that humans are fueling climate change. You know, climate is changing, and climate has always changed. Inhofe recently led a 98 to 1 vote agreeing that climate change is not a hoax. The hoax is that there are people who are so arrogant that they think they have the power to change climate. Now that's the hoax, and that is not the fact that, it's, uh, that climate is changing. Techno invited Senator Inhofe and the other majority Republican members of the Environmental Committee to appear. All declined or did not respond. First of all, it's interesting that, uh, that Senator Inhofe uh, argued that only God can change the climate, and not long thereafter, the Pope issued a statement saying the human impacts on climate are a great challenge for humanity. Why is this issue political in this country? I think the most fundamental reason is uh, this misperception that being in favor of addressing the climate change challenge is to be against jobs and the economy. I am not afraid to stand up to big oil. It does us no good to punish manufacturing in Missouri when India and China are putting up a coal-fired plant every 10 minutes. It's the same atmosphere. There are a lot of people in the political sphere who think that if you admit the reality of climate change, you are inviting a degree of government regulation that will be too pervasive, too intrusive, uh, and against the general inclinations particularly of political parties and factions that are anti-regulation. Do you think that substantial campaign contributions from the fossil fuel industry are a factor in the politics of climate change? Uh, yeah, I think that obviously has to be uh, recognized as a factor. One strong anti-regulation voice is Dr. Patrick Michaels, the director of the Center for the Study of Science at the Cato Institute. This libertarian think tank was co-founded by Charles Koch in 1974. Today, Koch and his brother David head Koch Industries, one of the largest private companies in America. Through their company and foundations, they generously contribute to politicians and issues surrounding the fossil fuel industry. Let's start really simply. Does climate change exist? Of course. Climate change has existed since the Earth got an atmosphere. Is climate change man-made. Some of it is, uh, has a human cause, that's correct. But Michaels is among a group of scientists cited by Senator Inhofe that believe the worsening climate change models are wrong. And I would argue that 
every model that we have, now, I wouldn't argue, these are the facts, okay? Shows that if we drop our emissions to zero, we don't do anything really detectable over the course of 100 years. That's incontrovertible reality coming from our own environmental protection agencies and models. That is the most irrelevant comment I have ever heard. Techno's Crystal Dilworth turned to Dr. Burton Richter, a Nobel Prize winning physicist from Stanford University, to fact check Dr. Michael's arguments about climate change. It's still going to be destructive. It's still going to have very big consequences. So the argument that it doesn't matter what we do, we're not going to be able to make a difference. I don't understand the point of that. This is a world issue. And the question is, what is the world going to do about the temperature rise? And if you look at the temperatures uh, measured in the lower atmosphere by satellites, or you look at all four analyses of the weather balloon data from about 5,000 to about 20,000 feet or so in the atmosphere, the disparity between the average of the 107 United Nations computer models, the, the disparity between the trends predicted by them, the average trends predicted by them, and what's been measured by the weather balloons and the satellite in the lower atmosphere is stunning. First of all, there aren't 107, there are 25 of these general circulation models. All this stuff about layers in the atmosphere and all that is a question that we do not fully understand. Where is the heat going? The big surprise in this period when the surface temperature uh, stayed relatively constant is that the temperature of the oceans is still going up. To stick your head in the sand and say everything is all right when there's not is foolish. We talked to Patrick Michaels at the Cato Institute, who's gotten quite a bit of press for his belief that the federal government has no business mitigating climate change. Well, I think he's just wrong about that. Obviously, I strongly disagree. You know, it's a little bit like the arguments uh, that used to go on about uh, tobacco smoking uh, and cancer, where for years there were people who disputed that smoking is implicated in uh, lung cancer. But the fact is, uh, in modern societies, there are a lot of activities that people might want to undertake that are regulated by the government because it's in society's interest to minimize the damages from those particular kinds of activities. That's true of smoking, and it's true of climate change. Miami Beach, Florida. The whole planet comes here to have fun. This is an unbelievable place to live. It's the hottest city in the world. In walking down this strip of Miami Beach, it's easy to see why it's an obvious tourist mecca. But it's also extremely vulnerable to rising sea levels, where most of it was built not more than four feet above tide lines. So how they're dealing with it here in Miami may become a blueprint for the rest of the country. We have pictures in a few blocks from here of people on their kayaks when it's high tides and floods. Valerie Navarrete lives a block away from the bay and has already paid the price of sea rise when her condo's parking area turned into a swimming pool. By the time we realized what was going on, neighbors were coming down, everybody was helping each other, pushing the cars, and most of us uh, lost our cars. You've seen water in the streets during sunny days without rain. Sandwiched between the Atlantic Ocean and Biscayne Bay, high tide in Miami Beach has literally been inching up over the last 20 years. First by a third of an inch a year, and in the last five years, accelerating at 1.27 inches annually. Two feet of uh, sea level rise is projected from roughly 2040 to 2060. So when we get to that point, the people out here on the high ground, they'll still be fairly dry. These people will be having all kinds of issues with salt water getting in their yards. 
Pete Harlem is the Geographic Information Systems Coordinator at Florida International University. This map shows three feet of sea level rise on South Beach. By 2100, Miami Beach could disappear under six feet of sea level rise. So there's an enormous effort to save the city. To the casual observer, it might just look like a construction nightmare. But as an engineer, I can tell you the challenges throughout the city are massive and the solutions impressive. So I thank each and every one of you for being here and let's install these great pumps to keep the city dry. All this construction is to install even more pumps. We're going to put in about 70 to 80 all across our city. First term mayor Philip Levine is overseeing the huge pump project with each one able to move 14,000 gallons of water a minute. So what exactly is going on here? So this over here is <clears throat> they're dewatering the ground and they're putting in some additional filtration system to make sure that the pumps that are in the ground will put out water that'll be cleaner and back into the bay. The problem isn't just water topping seawalls, but water bubbling up from below. Miami Beach is built on porous limestone that absorbs the rising water. As the limestone gets saturated by rising sea, there's an upsurge of water through the sewer system. So far, eight pumps have been installed and seem to be doing the trick. We think we have a great 50 to 60 year solution. Now after that, we believe human innovation and technology will catch up. This is the first time anybody's done this before on a citywide scale anywhere in the world. We're the guinea pig here, so we're gonna make some mistakes. We're gonna All get the pioneers. Some... We're the pioneers, I like it. With a lifetime in Miami, Dan Kipnis is a retired boat captain and is now an environmental activist. He took us on a tour of the city's mitigation efforts. Let me show you something over here. They're gonna raise the sidewalks, that mark right down there, look at that. That must be what, two feet? At least two feet, and uh, it's fine for this building because they've already raised the base of this new building that they're building. But for that house over there, the door is gonna be two feet below the sidewalk. So what's drastically different about the building they're building over there? Well, their first floor is six feet off the ground. Their first floor. If you gotta leave this building, we'll be leaving Miami Beach. Keeping everyone here by installing pumps, building seawalls, and raising streets and buildings comes with a big price tag. It sounds necessary, but also very expensive. How much is it all gonna cost? We expect the total bill to be to three to four hundred million dollars. We expect to go to the federal government, the state government. Ironically, when it comes to climate, Florida's construction challenges aren't the only obstacle. This is climate models all over the world. Dr. The ben Kurtman, a researcher at the University of Miami, joined a group of climate scientists for a meeting with Florida's Republican governor, Rick Scott, posted online. When they're trying to get resources from, uh, from the state of Florida, they can't really talk about the climate change part of it. Christopher Byrd is a former Florida state deputy attorney who worked on waterways issues. They said, if you know what's good for you, you will not use the terms climate change, global warming, sea level rise, or sustainability. Governor Scott denies there's a policy against discussing climate change. First off, that's untrue. Uh, at our Department of Environmental Protection, uh, look, there's, a, there's a, lots of conversations uh, about this, this issue. What's really hard, I think, for politicians to get their head around is how to respond to the problem that's going to happen in 2100. That's when, worst case, Miami Beach could be under six feet of water. So what's your opinion when Republicans say man has not caused climate change? As mayor, I don't have the liberty or the time to debate uh, why climate change is happening. All I have is the opportunity to fix it. That bay is not Republican, it's not Democrat, it knows no limits. No matter who pays the bill, it will only be a short-term fix. With all of that innovation that's being proposed for Miami, do you think it's actually going to solve the problem? No, it's not going to solve the problem. As long as sea level continues to rise, Miami Beach is constantly going to have to be uh, developing new technologies, investing new monies and in infrastructure to balance the, the pressures that are caused by sea level rise. So what about residents that have been there for their entire lifetimes? What are they going to do? Well, I've been here my entire lifetime. I know for a fact I'm going to have to leave. A bit of land on Florida's Virginia Key is home to the world's largest hurricane simulation lab. 
at the University of Miami's Rosensteel School for Marine and Atmospheric Science. It feels like a giant swimming pool <laughs> in there. Roughly the size of a large swimming pool. Dr. Brian House runs Sustain, short for Surge Structure Atmosphere Interaction Facility. Why is it so important to be able to recreate these conditions in a chamber? There's a couple of things that we're really keen to figure out. What causes hurricanes to intensify rapidly, to go from, say, a Cat 3 to a Cat 5 in less than a 24 hours? And that's important for not just for hurricanes, but it's very important for climate change issues. We were invited to see a full speed demonstration. You want to run it in half so it doesn't splash so much? There's no computer model today that can get to the physics of what happens when a high wind is ripping the top off the wave. Researchers want a better understanding of the critical transfer of heat from the ocean's surface and sea spray to the atmosphere. So what wind speeds are we at right now? We are at the equivalent 80 mile an hour wind. It's about category one storm. And this house is getting totally battered. No, and it's I only category one. The large waves bringing the water level up and the wind blowing on top of that. That's that's really what we're trying to capture. Sensors track the force pushing against the structure. We have to understand how we can build to have our buildings be resilient in these conditions. No more. Finally time to crank it up to full speed. 150 miles per hour, a category five hurricane. Whoa, I can really feel it vibrating now. Wow, that was something else. I mean, it was a real rush for me. Studying a storm in a tank isn't just an academic exercise for the researchers here. We all have chosen to, to live here, to have, have our families and our homes here in this place where we're just above sea level. It's a very personal issue for us. The reality on the ground there in Miami seems so drastic, but also it seems like a different reality than what they have in D.C. True, but what's really interesting to me is that the Department of Defense has moved beyond the politics. This is their 2014 climate change adaptation roadmap. And they have accepted that climate change is happening. It's going to impact our national security. It's a threat multiplier. It's going to have effects on all of our military installations. So they're not worried about the politics or what's causing it. They're just making plans for the future. So whether there's a debate politically, scientifically, 97% of all published papers are in agreement, and it's just 3% that don't agree. But yet everyone focuses on that. And it's interesting because the 3% is actually necessary for scientific process. You need to have you know, the, the main conclusions challenged in some way. These people are scientists. Crystal, who are they? They're contrarians. When you're taking a look at those 3% that maybe, as we say, don't agree with the other 97, what does that really mean? Oftentimes in science, we're taking a very, very narrow look at a very specific thing. And that doesn't necessarily fit in context of the whole. This type of debate, this type of view is very important. But unless you add up all of those tiny little measurements, all of those tiny little publications, and really take a look at the big picture, you're not understanding the whole problem. Because obviously this is a discussion we could have for hours. It is a fascinating topic, and as the science advances, as the politics advance, we will stay on it. Be sure to check us out next time here on Techno, and we'll bring you more. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus, and more.